This video is about a neon sign in Glasgow and it's quite unusual because it's what could be called a neon spectacular. It's a very big sign. Each of these stars is the same height as me. It covers the side of a building and it's animated. And later in this video, I'm going to show you the control that's actually used to animate it because uh, a chap called Jim Stinson got in touch and said, do you want to see the control? And I said, well, yes, I do. And I took some video of it so that we can all take a look at it. But let's start at the very beginning. Let's move this picture out of the way and look at this old black and white picture because Glasgow did have a history of major neon signs and you may not know that these days because uh, they, they all got stripped out. Uh, it went through an architectural phase when it was considered unsightly. So the story starts in the early 1900s and a chap called Georges Claude uh, developed a new technique for liquefying air, basically extracting gases from the air. And he started a company called Air Liquid, which is still about. He was also notable for working out you could uh, st store acetylene gas in uh, acetone to make it more stable. But he now had loads of interesting gases, noble gases, including neon, at his disposal. And inspired by Geissler tubes, he developed neon sign technology, the processing of it and the electrodes. And he started a company called Claude Neon. And it was around about the 1920s, and it just launched neon signs big time. And a good example of that, he's credited with introducing neon to America uh, in around about 1925. Uh, and the company, Young Electric Sign Company, Yesco, uh, latched onto that big time. And well, the rest is history. Just look at Las Vegas. That's what happened. And... It's quite interesting because if you look at this sign here, you can see the outline of this chap's feet. This is a, the William Younger's beer advert. And you can see the outline of his feet in multiple stages of animation. So there was animation going on there. And that's like what this video is largely about. But um, there was a boom in these signs uh, up between the 1920s and the 1960s. And then... Glasgow clamped down on it, and it's a shame because I really struggled to find pictures of neon signage in Glasgow. Uh, so that's the uh, William Younger's beer sign. It's all beer and cigarettes, I have to say. There is uh, stoned dates as well, and yeah, it's mostly alcohol, isn't it? And baby milk. It's got them in milk and alcohol. Another sign I found that was in Glasgow, and I remember these because I, I was round about in the late 60s. Uh, this is the Bar's Iron Brew sign, which had a character called Bar Brew. Uh, Crawford Houston, thank you for taking this picture in the past. It was on Facebook. Um, it's just, it was the only picture I could actually find, other than the sign that the picture of being stripped down, because unfortunately, the PC brigade got onto the bandwagon and said, he is black, and this is not appropriate that he should be advertising things. They ignored the fact that Bar Brew, which was advertising Bar's Iron Brew, his best friend in a cartoon at the time was Sandy, who was a wee Scottish lad, all dressed up in the kilt and bonnet and everything. Not that racist at all, really, because they were best friends. It could, could have done stuff for... yeah. But anyway, it gets stripped down, unfortunately. and replaced the more appropriate sign of the big clock in it, apparently. There's one sign I could not find. It was the Robertson's Jam sign, which was also a little bit racist, apparently. It had a picture of a gollywog in it, licking its lips with the animation of the tongue going backwards and forwards. Yeah, it's gone. I couldn't find any picture of that at all. I remember it. I just uh, haven't been able to find images of it. So that brings us to... The point that uh, Claude Neon, the big success, worth mentioning that uh, I worked with a guy, one of my aerial access platform drivers, we were chatting, the subject got on to signage, and uh, he said, oh, I used to work for Claude Neon. And I was like, it was so odd, because I, I look at that as a really ancient company. Talking of which, talking of ancient companies, uh, I wonder if this sign, it was, I think it was replaced by either Tate or Pierce. Uh, other big companies in Scotland, Merson Signs come to mind, but the biggie at the time, the Scottish equivalent of Yesco was a company called Franco Signs. I think it was F A F R E N C O, uh, and they did a lot of major neon spectaculars until Glasgow Council banned Skyline Signs. But anyway, moving on. 
In the 1985, the Barrowlands did something wild. Really unexpected, they commissioned a company called Harper Signs to install this sign. And it spells out, it's animated, it spells out, I shall link to videos of it. Uh, but it spells out B-A-R-R-O-W-L-A-N-D, then the outline lights, and then all the stars light, and the little stars chase around the outside. And then it sort of it goes out, but it doesn't just go out. It staggers out. And I was looking at it thinking, if they used a cam switch? And I naively assumed that they'd used one of these. I thought it was going to be a traditional cam switch as used in control systems that you can get them various lengths. And these have micro switches in them. They've got a, a synchronous motor, a gearbox, and then the cams. And you can program the cams by basically putting a little Allen key in and uh, adjusting these. And if I zoom down in this, if I zoom down in it, I can show you it. Uh, controlling the switches. As it rotates, you'll see switch one, switch two, switch three, switch four, and then reset. And if you hear them resetting, let me just let you hear this. Hear that they, they're all a bit staggered. That was reminiscent of the Barrowland sign sort of resetting. So, in the original signs, they used cam switches like this, and they're very old. The, keep in mind that these neon signs in the early days, they were before electronic control systems really existed, so it was mechanical, and they just tended to improvise. So there are vintage pictures of huge, huge banks of these cams all fine-tuned. And uh, this is a style of American control that was used, well, still is used in a lot of signage. And it's notable for the spinning disc at the side and the uh, basic gearing onto the cams. And the cams are these Paxilin type discs with the uh, screw here so you can adjust the position and then you can adjust the contacts. The contacts don't snap up and down. They just open and close slowly, which you'd think it would hurt quite a bit. And it does cause some contact pitting. To adjust the contacts, you uh, loosen the little nut, you use a screwdriver and you fine tune the contact and then you tighten the nut up. Lots of setting up. Uh, here's one and here's a, a picture from the different angle. I was hoping to show the magnet uh, on this disc because it is literally a hand-built motor. It's, it uses the same technique as your electricity meter um, the old electricity meters that had the magnet clamped over the aluminium disc and it creates a, a very simple motor. But let me show you the uh, let me show you what the Barrowland sign actually looks like running. <laughs> Well, the contacts are quite slow in this. I was expecting them to snap open and close much faster. I wonder if it arcs much. That's also why when the sign all goes out, it sort of it staggers out. It doesn't go out decisively. So I was not expecting that. I was not expecting Harper Signs to have used an American style uh, speller. The speller is like these, but the discs are uh, specifically cut to actually basically close these contacts one at a time, spelling it out, and they've got big long banks of them. Um, and it turns out that this isn't old technology. Well, it is old technology, but it's not out of date technology. Because if you want one of these, you can go online and buy it. You can buy a genuine control system as used for the Las Vegas signs. It's not cheap, but it's all hand-built. You know, there's a lot of time involved in making these. And they've still got that same motor that you could see then buzzing away with the coils. Uh, other things worthy of note, the coils by... You've got dampers and things like that. You can actually move the coils in or the magnetic dampers in. It will actually change the speed of the wheel. Uh, so each of these comes with a... You can choose the gearing ratio for a certain time range, but then you can actually adjust it further by moving dampers or the coils in in these. Is it visible in this one? It's not visible in this one. 
I should have looked for better pictures. There weren't better pictures. It's not something that's, that's widely findable. But it is now because the link is in the description down below. But there we go. Interesting. So that is what's behind the scenes of the Barrowland sign in Glasgow. So next time you see it animating, there's a little box making loud buzzing noises with those contacts arcing slightly and opening and closing. Very interesting. Latterly in Las Vegas, they, uh, they did switch to electronic control. Um, but it's quite, neon signs are a pretty tough load to switch electronically, much better these days with solid state relays and stuff like that. It's worth also mentioning that these sparklers, I think these, these are sparklers that chase quite quickly and ripple. They're still in use in Las Vegas and they're still in the use on fairgrounds. They were chosen for fairground lighting because these things, well, in, instead of electronic components blowing up, you may have to just clean the contacts and that's about it and retune them a bit. But if something blows up, these are fairly resilient to that. So there we go. That is a little potted history of neon signs and uh, the Barrowland sign in particular. <laughs>